Uh, this is a slice of a uh, research that was recently accepted for publication. Um, I have two uh, areas of interest. Um, major one um, as a theme, uh, I'm interested in creativity um, and its assessment, more specifically, even more specifically divergent thinking. Uh, as a methodology, I, I do uh, meta-analyses from time to time. Uh, so I like the idea of bringing research together uh, and make a summary out of it and understand why research in our field, education psychology, education and psychology too, uh, maybe social science in general, have a lot of inconsistencies in their findings, make, make sense of those inconsistencies. Why there is heterogeneity in our findings, can we understand them? Can we make sense of them? Um, so this is a meta-analysis. Um, so the main project we were able to publish recently uh, was a meta-analysis of socioeconomic status and creativity. So as a follow-up, here I present a slice of a divergent technique test and how they relate to those SES. Um, um, and specifically, my guiding research was if I know which divergent thinking test is less susceptible to ACS differences, maybe those tests should be prioritized in education and assessment so that we are more inclusive. We are not discriminating in specific populations, specifically students in poverty. Um, so that was the guiding motivation. But also when you do meta-analysis, uh, you bring in all kinds of research publications that come with many different characteristics. So you want to control them. Um, so this is what this study is about. I have uh, a lot of support from my colleagues, Harun, Rejet, uh, Danielle, and Betun, who have the coding and, and, and writing this project. All right. So, um, so in the field of uh, creativity, we have one model that emphasizes the importance of context and environment very much, and that's Csikszentmihalyi's and, and Janessa uh, talked about that as well. Uh, so in this model, um, the author doesn't ask what is creativity, but where is creativity because it's highly contextual. Um, so according to that framework, uh, the creative individuals or individuals in general use their, uh, their fields language and terminology, uh, and they write, uh, as we uh, spoke briefly about it, they wrote for their colleagues who, who give the approval, right? So in, in the peer review process, it's other scholars who give you a go. Uh, so that's the triangle, especially in academic, um, in academia, we see how creativity is happening. So it, it's a model that balances individual factors with societal or, or external factors. Uh, and our field has been very much based on dispositional factors. So we, we were more interested in personality characteristics of creative individuals or cognitive abilities of creative individuals. Now we came to recognize, even though it's a little late, maybe to, to many of you, uh, those personality traits, especially cognitive traits, don't operate uh, in isolation from their uh, contextual uh, background. So some recent scholarship uh, really emphasized that. Of course, SES is one of those big factors, contextual factors, uh, especially uh, in 70s, 80s, there was lots of debates about intelligence tests and how they re reflect the, uh, the privileged uh, communities, uh, um, way of life, they, 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 their world, their values, and how using those tests can actually discriminate against um, um, minorities or, or, or kids from poverty. Um, and, um, and, and we see that when we look at SES, there is a clear gap in terms of academic achievement. Usually kids from higher SES outperform kids from low SES. Uh, but also when we talk about SES, uh, we are not talking about a uniform structure. So in general, SES reflects uh, a, a student's social standing where it stands in, in, in respect to his or her uh, society, but also it, it includes uh, economic factors like parents' income, right, as, as one factor. Occupation is another one. Uh, or where you live, the zip code is another factor. Uh, your own education, your parents' education. So all of those factors come together, making up what we call SES. So when we, when we look at SES, we are also interested in which aspect of SES we are talking about and which of those might be more influential. Um, we do have some SES indicators or the way they are measured in, in the individual studies from one angle only, like income, 
whereas in some other studies, a bunch of them are measured together. So we are interested in seeing uh, if 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 those specific operationalization of SES is uh, is making any difference. Um, so when we look at SES, um, it impacts lots of academic outcomes, language achievement, better science achievement, uh, reading performance, cognitive functions, usually always and consistently favoring high uh, SES kids, middle and high class, usually outperform kids from uh, poverty. So uh, one could argue that if you know this, like kids who are more successful academically, kids who are more who, who, who perform better in, in intelligence tests, maybe that same effect, whatever that is, it may impact creativity too, because sometimes the kind of questions we have in, in creativity assessment, um, they, they can be cognitively oriented and the way it impacts intelligence can also impact divergent thinking or creativity tests in general. So cognitive advantages, the advantages from SES in cognitive development may show uh, some impact uh, in, a, in, in those measures. Also, when we look at the, uh, when we look into the literature, we also see that when we, even when we don't use a cognitive measure uh, of uh, creativity, when we give like self-reports, uh, we also see that literature shows uh, self-reports can also be biased by SES. So kids may uh, have a higher self-esteem if they are coming from middle or uh, or or self-concept if they are coming from middle or uh, higher SES. So SES is pretty much everywhere in any kind of assessment we do in our field, and knowing to what extent it impacts uh, performance on creativity tests, and if possible, choosing the ones that's going to be less influenced by SES is important. So. Um, um, but also there are some alternative explanations to that. One could argue that conceptually and theoretically coming from a low SES family can give you some unique advantages to be creative because you're in a position of problem solving all the, all, all the time because of lack of resources or, 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 or we have a saying uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So you, you're pushed to be creative all the time. Or if you watch the Slumdog Millionaire, maybe two, two decades ago, right? So it's all about like going through tough challenges that only you can know the answer uh, because of the good challenges that you, you have gone through. So so I think a, a one-sided argument that SES is always at disadvantage for creativity can be wrong. Maybe it's about a combination of how individuals react to their uh, con contextual factors uh, uh, re react to the situation they are in, maybe that that presents them some opportunities to be creative. Um, also, we know that um, lots of original ideas come from experiences. So people who go through some unique experiences that could be positive or negative can actually use those experiences to come up with, to, to come up with uh, original ideas. So, so there are a lot of reasons to expect that ECS is going to make a difference in uh, in creativity. But this was the scope of the general study we were able to publish. My focus in this presentation is divergent thinking tests. Divergent thinking tests are the most popular measures of uh, creativity, and it's my primary area of in, uh, area of research. So when when you when you give an intelligence test, you you're measuring. Uh, people's ability to identify the single best right solution uh, and it engages convergent thinking. So you have data, you have various data points and and and, uh, and facts and you, you're supposed to converge on a single best right solution. They are more difficult to build maybe, but they are very easy to score because there's only one right solution, you get one, one or zero. Divergent thinking tests were present in early tests of intelligence, but then they disappeared. Uh, and divergent thinking tests are the the the, the kind of um, um, items where you receive an open-ended question and you generate responses for it. So there is no one single right answer. Just like in writing that that we, we spoke about, you're given a prompt and you write an essay about it. You're free to write within certain parameters, but there isn't just one right way to write the essay. Right? There are some better essays and worse essays, but but, but you can reflect your style there within certain parameters. Divergent thinking tests are less common in educational assessment, but they are very important because they are giving kids to, the, the opportunity to come up with, to reflect their own authentic 
uh, way of uh, thinking. So um, we typically score them for fluency, flexible originality, and elaborations. Fluency is when kids or participants have many ideas, the more ideas the better. We also score it for flexibility, the variety of ideas. Uh, or, or third, originality, meaning you come up with ideas that other people don't. Or elaboration, some ideas can be more elaborate and elegant than, than the other ideas. So the, the higher points you get from those, the, 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 the higher performance you, you get. And we have different types of divergent ticket tests. So they, there isn't just one kind. And that's the, that's the question actually I was most curious about in this, in this journey. Should I pick one test over another if it has a lower correlation with ACS? So that was my main question here. So with alternative users test, you, you're given an everyday prompt, like a brick, that's the classic test, and you're asked to generate many different users for it. In what ways can you use a brick? So people generate multiple responses and we score them. In just, post, in just suppose test, we give them a hypothetical situation. What would happen if people had six fingers instead of five? So, so we give them some hypothetical and, and somewhat playful questions to stretch their mind and let them think about those hypothetical situations and come up with uh, answers. So, um, so the social impact of that, that research is in the idea that some of those kind of tests are used for gifted identification or in advanced academic programs. So if there is a high SES component, basically you're, you're using a system that will already recruit kids with privilege, right? So if high SES kids will, 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 will get in those programs, um, because maybe not because they are creative, but because they, they are SES, because tests reflect their, their values. So, um, and we know that low SES kids, uh, students from Black and Latinx families are underrepresented in gifted programs. So if we know that those tests are more fair than the other tests, maybe we can make some decisions there. So our research question was, uh, does the relationship between divergent thinking tests and creativity vary by specific type of divergent thinking question when we control other factors? So basically I'm asking which divergent thinking question or test should I select so that I can be more fair in my recruitment efforts if I'm doing recruitment for gifted education programs. And we try to control a bunch of other factors if, if the test is verbal or nonverbal, which is a quality of a test. So it's actually almost an integral, integral part of that test. Index of creativity, we score it for multiple indices as I have just explained. So which index I should be using or uh, is there one that I should consider dropping if, if it has a higher correlation with this? Yes. Uh, domain of creativity, measuring kids in a general domain of creativity versus specific domains like math and, and arts. Um, is that a factor? How do you measure CS? Is it income? Is it occupation? Is it education? Uh, is there one that I should be more careful about uh, when I, when I co uh, collect data uh, uh, so that I can control for those effects? So we control all of, all of those. That means we coded a bunch of studies for all of those factors. So you have to have a really good team to, to be able to code that stuff because it, it takes time. So we did a multivariate meta-analysis here, meaning we oftentimes uh, identify effect sizes, multiple effect sizes from a single study, and that creates dependency. You want to control for that. And we use Pearson R as our effect size metric. So the larger the correlation, the bigger the impact. Um, so um, we used our key terms and did a large database search without any uh, uh, um, year limitation. And uh, our primary study uh, was actually um, quite large. We had uh, 117 articles to code for the bigger study that we published. In the present one, I'm only focusing on divergent thinking tests. And in this one, we had 54 studies that presented data from seven to four samples because some studies are multiple samples. And then we had uh, 443 effect sizes. So still a large uh, meta-analysis that, that we have here. So my results uh, is um, in general, the, uh, the correlation between divergent thinking tests and SES is quite small, 0.08. So that's even uh, lower than 0.10, which we consider small effect size. So when we compare that to intelligence, it, it shows some advantage in using divergent thinking tests because SES impact is less, less, less visible there. But that wasn't the question I was after. Uh, I kind of knew that in my previous 
uh, examination already. I'm more interested in if that mean correlation varies significantly when I choose one divergent thinking test over another. So that's why we, we move to moderator analyses and we examine if any of those are significant. These are my moderator analyses. Moderator analyses are analogous to regression. So here you, your, your dependent variable is uh, R. So the mean effect size becomes your dependent variable and your moderators become your independent variables, your predictors. So you, you enter all of them into your model to see if any of those predictors, your moderators are related to your mean effect size, your, your, your mean correlation. Basically think about uh, the mean effect sizes from individual studies as a distribution. So, so some show a stronger R, some give you close to zero, so some give you a negative R, and you're wondering if that distribution varies for one test versus another. So you're interested in explaining heterogeneity and variability, which is almost all the time the thing that we see in, in social sciences. Uh, and the reason why we, we don't often replicate our findings because samples are different, measures are different, study conditions are different. You expect some heterogeneity, but also you want to explain them. So the, the ones in, in red are the significant moderators. So, um, so a, CS, a CS indicator was not significant. So whether it's income or parents' education or neighborhood, that doesn't really cause any variation in the effect sizes. They, they, are, they are quite much the same. Uh, divergent taking test type, that wasn't significant either. That was my primary question I was after. So that doesn't give me any data point in terms of choosing one, of, or one over the other. Whichever one you choose, it gives you pretty much the same thing, is the answer. Uh, type of publication, whether you uh, use studies from an article, versus dissertation versus unpublished work, that is significant. Divergent thinking test modality, that's verbal, figural, and else, uh, that was significant. Um, divergent thinking test index, not significant, participant group significant. So let's unfold those findings uh, to see if we have anything to learn. So that's the full model. It's a lot of numbers, I'm sorry, but I'll try to summarize the findings here. So when we look into, even though our, uh, um, main effect was not significant when we run a moderator analysis with um, uh, individual dummy coded comparisons when we use income as the reference category. People uh, who had a higher education in generally correlation with SES was stronger, uh, meaning having educated yourself, I mean, ha having been an educated person, uh, if you are so the correlation with SES is going to be higher in that in that scenario compared to uh, income uh, as the basis. Um, as you see here, these are divergent thinking tests, uh, specific types. They didn't really vary too much, or at least it wasn't significant. So whichever divergent thinking test you use, it doesn't really matter much. You get more or less the same picture. So uh, I, I, I cannot really favor or suggest one test over another. They're pretty much the same in terms of the relationship with SES, which is not too big anyway. Um, when we look into publication type, uh, the mean effect size is larger with published articles and dissertations than unsolicited work. Uh, so that's interesting to see. Maybe people have some works that they decided they decide not to publish for various reasons and, and publication bias is a reality. So that's one of the controls we have in our model. Um, correlation is smaller when we have participant groups who are not K-12 or college students. The, in general, the mean effect size is smaller with them. That was interesting. That gets close to a suggestion that I could make uh, for, for the literature. Then I use a test of creativity that is non-verbal. The mean effect size is, you see the negative sign here, it's smaller. So the, even though the overall correlation was 0 0.08, it's even smaller and gets close to zero if I go with a non-verbal test than a verbal test. Um, so that's interesting because we knew that in intelligence tests, verbal tests are heavily loaded with SES. And that's why scholarship has done a lot of work to build non-verbal tests of intelligence because the gap is too big in terms of uh, discriminating against or, uh, or, or having some gap between uh, ethnic uh, minorities. Here we see something similar, but the difference is quite smaller than what we see in intelligence tests. So rather than uh, making a suggestion to go with one test or another, 
if you are concerned with ACS related differences, a general suggestion to use nonverbal tests could be viable based on these findings. Uh, but we can't say just one test as better than the others. Um, and flexibility in general, that repeats our previous findings. When we look into flexibility, it, it has a higher correlation with uh, SES than the other indices, well, which kind of makes sense because as people with higher SES tends to go through more, more diverse experiences and maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not using that will give you some advantage, even though flexibility is a useful uh, indicator of uh, divergent thinking and creativity. Um, knowing that it, it generates a slightly higher correlation can also imply that it, it may create a disadvantage. Uh, and in one of our most famous tests, it was dropped for other reasons. So maybe that, that was a lucky moment for, for that particular test, uh, Torres test of creative thinking. So uh, this is technical stuff in terms of meta-analysis. So this is on a plot and it shows whether uh, a publication bias is a threat to your results. And what we are looking for here is a, a symmetry. When, result, when this funnel plot is symmetrical, so you have equal number of dots on the right versus left-hand side, you're usually good. And we have statistical tests to indicate that as well. It's looking good overall. So summary of my results. Overall, divergent thinking tests have a small correlation with ACS. It's less than 0.10. And to me, that's good news. And, and, and some scholars like the idea of incorporating critical tests in gifted identification more than so intelligence tests because intelligence tests can really put certain kids out of the gifted programs or advanced academies, unless you incorporate some alternative mechanisms like uh, local norms. So I think we have some evidence to support that. Uh, but specific test type was not significant, but it does vary by test modality. The mean effect size is smaller with nonverbal tests and larger with flexibility than, than fluency. So, um, so one major implication here is that uh, considering nonverbal measures of divergent thinking, if they are highly reliable and valid, uh, is one practical suggestion that I could make based on those results. Um, uh, that's all from me in terms of my slides, but I'll be happy to have any questions uh, if you have one.